Ich bin der Schlüsselmacher. Aber ich mache nicht einfach nur Schlüssel. Ich verschaffe dir Zugang zu den besten Geschichten der Welt. Denn meine Schlüssel bringen dich überall hin und können alles mit dir machen. Ist der hier für dich? Unlock Great Stories. Kanal Plus. Stream großartige europäische Serien und Filme. So, welcome all three of you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, would you mind giving us a quick introduction of yourselves? Maybe we can start with Mariana. Hello everyone. Nice to see you all here. I'm Mariana Danska, I'm a cultural manager since 2020. I work with Music Expert Ukraine and on promotion and making sure the emerging Ukrainian talents are seen in the wider European music community. Also, I work as a program manager at the Ukrainian Cinema Attack on the Sandra National Center, where we do, where I host um, international, local, interdisciplinary festivals, new movie screenings as well. And since recently, I am a temporary but very honored member of Face Festival here. So welcome you all. I can, I can, I have the right to welcome you all here. Thank you so very much, Agnes. Would you like to introduce Hello. Uh, I work for Music Export Latvia. Uh, I work for Music Industry already around 20 years. Um, I do a lot of educational stuff for the domestic market, uh, a lot of um, international activities, uh, trying to be active in any European Music Export Exchanger Association. Association, Association. Also, we are organizing a songwriting camp. It's all about music and luck. Thank you very much. Marcel. Hi, uh, my name is Marcel. Uh, I come from Serbia, Bosnia. Uh, I'm in the music and craft industry for two decades. Uh, we started back in the 2000s, and in the uh, last 20 years, we did like the next steps one for the country that didn't so much distribute, so we are now offering the future. So we have something about that. Uh, we are still surviving. Uh, two years ago, we started like a dance conference to go more like uh, regional and get connected. And here we are. Thank you. Great. Thank you all three so much for being here today. I think uh, my first question was, of course, to you, Mariana. Um, so, how can or how is the music ecosystem in Ukraine? Coping with the current situation, the situation of music being the war. Yeah, the war is something that you never be prepared. Um, so, talking about, so we have the artists as the biggest skeleton, and we have the ecosystem that, you know, makes it all going. So, when you think of, it was summer just recently, and you think of the festivals, but you can't do all the festivals in Ukraine because the main gathering with many people is very dangerous and forbidden. So the biggest Ukrainian festival at last weekend changed their uh, orientation into the humanitarian fund. They, they established the humanitarian fund and they're he helping people with humanitarian aid and they evacuate people from the combat zone, the civilians, I mean. Uh, if you're talking about the um, rental companies, uh, and the venues, basically, they are like in great risk of losing everything any minute. If the missile strikes the building or just even the intercepted one puts it on fire, you're losing really everything. So what our some of our rental companies did at the first days of full-scale invasion, they gave all their radio equipment to the military, to the National Guard, just because it's very helpful there. Uh, and some of them just probably starting with the festival season, they evacuate, literally evacuated their equipment abroad, mostly to Poland neighboring countries, and making it work there. Uh, also, booking managers, um, they working heavily on uh, doing the shows, like booking the shows for supporting Ukraine. So all the charity events that has been done with the Ukrainian bookers, with the international community and those who are working with local Ukrainian artists, they also working with the Ukrainian artists who flee the war to Europe. Um, but if you see as a, like how would you do an event uh, or a festival or something, 
uh, during the war times. It's, and I can share my experience with you uh, at the Genda Center in Kyiv. So the first thing, you, the, what do you think about the festival? You, you have the lineup, you have the backline, you know, the price for the tickets, beer prices, everything, COVID restrictions, of course. Uh, but then you, you, you need to think of, okay, the curfew. So basically, all the audience have to take the last bus, at least. Uh, then I have to think that the whole rental they should wrap up and get their things to the place and get them home, themselves home by the curfew as well. Then you have the air raid sirens. So in Ukraine, you, you are allowed to do events when people have the access to the bomb shelter. In case of the general center, it's like 30 meters from the exit is the uh, subway station. But the thing is that. Uh, when you're thinking about the evacuation, think about air, uh, fire alarm. It's very simple. It, it's like the time is calculated, you have fire extinguishers and everything is so But with air and siren, it's, you don't know how much time left. You don't know how much time till the actual missile coming or not. It's not fixed because it can drop even before the siren sometimes. And this is how it works. And uh, you, you should think of, okay, if you have the glass doors, probably you better cover them because the glass is the one that hurts a lot. Um, okay, uh, you evacuated people, and then you're thinking, okay, um, what will I do with, with your lineup then after the, the siren is off? Uh, but the, the biggest problem is that when the siren is while the music is on, and I had this situation, this really nightmare situation when I was. Like the, the, the headliner just started the show, everybody are happy, finally meet that having their so, a glimpse of a normal life. And I went out for to get in the fresh air, and I hear the siren is on, and I'm the only, me and the few people who were smoking outside, knowing about that air is siren. And yes, this was before the Krimenchuk attack on the shopping mall, but it still, it, it was clear to me that this is a real vital threat to all 500 people in, inside. So I ran away to, to the whole hall to the, to the stage and everybody are happy and only I know that, that we might die soon and, and I'm, I'm screaming out loud to those people like, we stop, it's alarm! And they finally, for the third time, they hear me, they stop the music, they ask people to be, but because the band was like so performative, nobody believed them, literally. Everybody was thinking that it's, you know, like the kind of part of a performance. So eventually we evacuated people, but what, what will you do next? Well, when the siren will be off, can you continue? Can you not? Should you stop? Should you? Because people were really waiting, waiting for that, um, that to play. And this is kind of risk you're in country now during the war. Um, it's obviously a, a, an extreme situation for, for everyone. Um, Agnese, you also shared your initial reaction to the war in Ukraine um, and how it has almost reignited the spirit of what is called the singing revolution in the Baltic states. Um, could you describe to us your initial reaction to the war in Ukraine and how it is linked to this singing revolution? going back to even Soviet times. Yeah, uh, I hope that I will not offend anybody uh, because uh, it was uh, early morning when I received uh, an email from INI, European uh, Music Exporter Exchange Association, and it was all about projects and deadlines that we need to submit the project and we need to fill out forms, blah, blah, blah. And in the end of the email, it was like, on oh, this and we are very sorry for our Ukrainian colleagues, and that's really terrible, and that's it. And actually, I was uh, very shocked. Mm, I felt uh, very not to cry because I'm very emotional. And then I understood that uh, uh, actually, uh, that's not their fault that my colleagues do not understand what is uh, war and that you need to fight for your freedom. And what is actually war? It's not only fighting for your land uh, borders, but you are fighting for your culture, for your language, uh, for your identity, for your rights to speak your mother language, and all these huge, very important things that actually we do not 
uh, pay enough attention because it's just a regular thing that we use every day. But that's what Ukrainians can lose in any moment, not only their lives, but they can lose everything. And in the beginning, I had this feeling like, so what should I do? I'm nobody, I'm from a very small country, from post-Soviet Union country, so now I should write an email to all these big countries, France, Germany, England, and like ask them not to be silent and act. And then I understood like, yeah, maybe that's why I'm actually in this association, and that's one of the things I can do. And I felt very, very bad for my colleagues in Ukraine, because if I felt abandoned in that situation, in that email, then I could not imagine what they felt and thought when they received this email about deadlines, uh, project you resubmitted, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I called my colleagues uh, in Ukraine and Estonia and I told them, like, hey guys, we have this uh, experience with uh, Singing Revolution, we know what's uh, about way we Fight it for in the UK. Sorry yeah, for yeah. Not. Really, the UK. Yeah. Just reiterate exactly what the Singing Revolution was about, especially uh, during the Soviet times, towards the end of the yeah. Cold War, and then after the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah, I grew up when uh, it was not okay to speak my uh, native language. Uh, I grew up when I could not sing the songs I wanted to sing and uh, listen to fairy tales uh, my parents wanted to tell me. So. Uh, and it was not only me, it was like all those Soviet Union countries. And uh, the way how Baltic states figured out that they could uh, fight for their freedom was through singing, because that's a huge power, and uh, you can put so much, not only emotions, but, uh, but also meaning in lyrics. People who do not understand the language, they will not understand the game of lyrics, how you put these words together. And it's like a coded language. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, in 1985, we had like this huge thing in Baltic singing and dancing festival, and it happened for almost in three years. And in 1985, um, Soviet Union, uh, they were planning to build electro keeper electro station on biggest river in Latvia Daugava and everybody understood that this uh, electro station will totally destroy uh, the river and uh, environment protection group I don't know the right name was from that organization uh, they started to speak out that it's very important to save the river and at the same time uh, was happening this huge dancing and singing festival and in the love concert it was showed on national TV there was quite a 25,000 people. Uh, in the end, people started uh, to name uh, the song they want to sing, and it was one of the forbidden songs. And uh, it was shown on TV, and they started to sing that song. And actually, that was the feeling and the first time when people understood that through the music and through the songs, they can show they. Uh, position and they can speak of their rights and uh, everybody was, of course, everybody was very scared because we had this history that people are killed and not to Siberia, etc, etc. And then we understood that you cannot, what they would do that if people come out on the streets and sing or in family events they will to start to sing these songs and there is nothing political in those songs but meaning in those songs is such a deep and the message so it's almost like a protest without maybe pointing the finger towards a yeah. certain issue but being like a, a coded language yes. a song yeah. protest I, I found it so interesting that uh, some of these songs that were sung during the singing revolution in the Baltic states uh, have been almost like reactivated uh, yes. uh, right now during during the war in Ukraine especially uh, it, like as a sign of sort of solidarity, but also as a, almost like you bring comeback historical uh, to 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 this Soviet grasp that is still clinging on. I found it very very interesting. Is, is that what you experienced as well? 
Uh, yes, of course, uh, of course, we were very scared and we thought that we will be next and a lot of people were preparing to leave the country and uh, like uh, the first days when it, you cannot describe what was happening uh, in families, in conversations, etc, um, etc. Et and uh, people started to remember uh, how we were fighting for our freedom, what happened in the uh, 90s, like how yeah. my father was going to the capital of Latvia and my mom was uh, hiding his pumping uh, rifle in greenhouse because mm -hmm. he was going to Riga, he was going to show to the Russian army. Mm -hmm. And we started to remember all these things we were not talking about. And uh, I was not sharing these stories with my friends, with my colleagues, with my foreign colleagues, and they never even, I think. Uh, could imagine that there's such a thing. The 90s that you mentioned is um, a very, very important time. It was also a very important time uh, during the Yugoslav Wars, obviously. Uh, musicians uh, coming together during times of great crisis and war is something that has also occurred during the Yugoslav Wars, uh, especially around 1992 in Sarajevo, when the city became almost like a prison to its inhabitants due to the uh, Yugoslav army. So uh, how, and I mean, even on a practical level, even infrastructure-wise, how did the music community uh, of Sarajevo manage to cope with that situation? The 90s. The 90s. <laughs> Basically, um, there were like three interventions for music industry. The first one before the war trying to save uh, the country not to happen. So there were big protests and uh, music was uh, in the old uh, Olympic uh, venue. Uh, the focus was to start the war and uh, of course they didn't stop it. And then um, Um, so basically, the, the, during the war, uh, 1902 to 93 was like the, totally nobody believed what's happening. So you have the, the state of shock first, and then people figure out like every piece of imitating or practicing normal for one hour, two hour, like something like I said before. It was precious for you. So, so, so basically, um, there was. Um, we uh, focusing the whole resources from the hospital, gas, from the uh, police station, uh, electricity for the radio station. So everybody was hacking somehow the resources. You say hacking. I all, you, all, you also told me about uh, cables being stolen yeah, from yeah, the Red Cross. Yeah, so yeah. 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 Red Cross uh, had electricity on the generator. Yes. We finished number five. We go with the hooks. Put the metal on and you keep electricity for something. So uh, it's a similar thing to like in Ukraine, but it was more like. Um, you know, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like a, it sounds to me as if music during times of war and this kind of crisis is almost as essential as medical supplies. It, so. it creates to you the truth, like what then did. Yeah. You know, like, you, you have a crystal clear mind, you are on the ground, you are on the fear. So basically, uh, you can uh, really uh, define what's, like, what you need, what's right for you, and that's how we are just starting to, uh, to create the, the kind of uh, theater shows in the basements, the, 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 the concerts, the, the radio gatherings, the uh, music industry from all over the globe start coming. Borderbox was like uh, 93, 94, just mm -hmm. come by from New York City, so yeah. you know, before the YouTube concert later. Mm -hmm. So uh, everybody wanted to give their uh, like kind of uh, support for it, but there was no internet. It was like more analog kind of connection, not so digital and now media uh, defined as you can. I found it so interesting when we talked about uh, this whole situation. You also sent me some pictures, and you were explaining like uh, how important it was for the people to feel a sense of normalcy during the most abnormal situation, and how it is uh, crucial, tremendously crucial, to keep uh, the spirit alive. And you also 
have shown me a picture, I think, of a woman going very nicely dressed in front of a soldier, uh, which also felt to me almost like a form of protest. Um, so um, it was very, very, uh, it, it left an impression. <laughs> so, uh, oh, okay, so unfortunately not showing right now, but um, we can fix it in a second. So maybe we can even find uh, that picture that was very, very, um, well, um, so having this sense of normalcy, but you also talked a lot about resilience, how people are building resilience in time, in, in times like this. Uh, obviously, when we, when we see all of these pictures, um, it's, oh yeah, I think that was, that was the picture you were, you were talking about and that you so, showed me. Yeah, the statement was very clear. Like, uh, everybody wants to have a statement of normal life. It doesn't matter when it is for you. Is it singing? Is it looking nice? Is it so everybody took that piece and we're, and somehow uh, the woman, uh, the, the English photographer took this image and uh, she was like, uh, went all over the globe. And it was like somehow a statement of Sarajevo in that moment. We, uh, we were three and a half years in the biggest siege in the modern warfare. So we were totally closed as a city. Yeah. Nothing could come in or out. So that was the like, really moment. And in that moment, you figure out like what's your focus, what are your essentials, and how you can cope with the other. I, I find it also so interesting uh, that it was a very techno-infused and rock-infused sound during these times. Uh, so we had uh, the the techno infused sounds uh, in, in the Balkans, we had uh, the singing revolution um, in, the, in the Baltic states. So, how, now back to you again, Mariana, what can we observe right now in Ukraine? Is there a specific style, some specific, maybe even genre that is currently blowing up? How do people, how do artists, musicians, express themselves? Is there a particular language? And it was my presentation to me. Yes. <laughs> awesome. um, so, talking about music, um, the first day is at the uh, that time, and uh, um, I really gave till the early August. And I remember those times when you can't listen to music, you just can't. The only thing you, you hear is, is there any explosion near or near or far? Is there artillery? This is the missile. Um, you can concentrate on everything. You hear the sound, you run, you... So basically, this is the state of a constant alert. And um, I remember sitting in the subway station when I was spending my crew few nights, and I realized that we have a release song on the 10th or 11th day of full-scale invasion and that was a it was meant to, for this slide here but um, there was a song that written, literally written during the full-scale invasion that was a sign that okay we probably we are scared we are horrified but we managed to leave and this is a sign that we leave and we will leave um, as we have this picture, I must say that from the first days, many, really many uh, singers, musicians went to the army, to the National Guard or to the territorial defense, or to, to the military units. Um, you probably know, have heard of Andrei Hlodnyuk and his uh, performance of the shirt, first verse of the song, so this is the guy who was spending his uh, this long two days of curfew on the streets of Kiev and that's how he wanted to support us because this is the song that was written 100 years ago. This was a song that was um, like an anthem for those people who were fighting for Ukrainian independence that we managed to get back in 19. 18. So um, then you have like musicians saw that okay, we, we have to work, we have to produce, we have to reflect because uh, basically 
if, if you're an artist, the, the main thing for an artist is to take these raw facts and horrible facts from the reality, process them, like have this painful processing, and then release a, an artwork that will communicate, that will be like a mini mediator with the whole community, the international community. I remember my personal experience is that when, you, when I post the photos of the real facts in Bucha, in, 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 uh, in Borodanka, in, in, in combat zone, people tend to react to this less. But when you put an artwork of an illustrator, when you put the video with a music piece to tell the story, people tend to feel this engagement. And this is engagement which is crucial now during the war for us. Uh, again, musicians realize that they're influencers, but not influencers for themselves. They're influencers, they are the greatest power that their communities, their audience can have a cause. So they are also like they're helping, they're doing their best to help collect funds for humanitarian aid, collect funds to buy some equipment for the, for the army. And, like, all this concept that we have inside the country, Outside, probably, you, you see uh, performer, performers from Ukraine. We all do charity concerts because they all we have the same cause. We are united to supply, to, to help our, our to poor displaced people and to help uh, our army. But still, we have the next, the next slide. Uh, so this is the QR code that list, uh, leads you to the uh, Spotify a playlist that we started to build up like the first day like when I heard this song when I, when I saw this song released on the May March 6th I, I, I think so so I realized okay we have to collect that because this is a documentation because we live in historical times now and probably there is there are no academic research yet on how people react on this brutality on, 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 on these horrors but this is the documentary thing basically this will be studied and I, I, I invite you to experience that as well um, I, I, I think maybe maybe we can summarize it that as it is happening and as long as we don't have analysis analysis of how exactly the expression looks like or what different styles we have that it is a once uh, the the first time in history that we are living almost through a war, also through social media, mm -hmm. and uh, that we have the audiovisual uh, thing, as I would say. The yeah, audiovisual soundtrack, uh, which has also a very uh, broad spectrum of emotions as well, which, are, which I found very interesting. Could you explain us about the different? Yeah, so uh, each person experiences the, the horrific events differently. So some people managing to hold us together and to process those horrible facts into a motivation song. So we have a, like uh, this a song written 100 years ago was just one, but we have uh, basically we, we have the war for eight years in Ukraine and we have a, literally uh, a lot of music that is motivational for people to continue resist not only uh, like the army, but also people of the occupied territories. They are living next to the occupiers every day and they have a threat to be killed, to be to be to appear into captivity. The other songs are it's it's a longing for peace because we lost the normal life. We we, we don't have that that life anymore. We we, we tend to have, you know like joke about like can we have COVID back, please? Because basically, this is there was a way more more normal life than we have now, and also, like the, but the most important thing that this serves is mediation. If you want to know how we feel, listen to the music. It will explain all our, all our emotions. What I find especially interesting is that the Ukrainian language is very melodic. So when you, uh, I don't know. Uh, I had the pleasure to grow, grow up with, with uh, the Ukrainian language as well, and I find it very soft, almost poetic. Uh, so it is only natural that the songs right now are 
very melodic and also very, very soft. Of course, there are, I'd say, battle themed anthems uh, that are very motivating uh, so, uh, and energetic, but um, the, what, what, at least correct me if I'm wrong, what I, uh, <laughs> what I perceived is it was more soft and melodic and going uh, deeper. So, yeah. Yeah, we're backing, we realized that even uh, to those people, performers who were, you know, using that Russian language as a way to have wider markets. We have an example of uh, like changing back to the Ukrainian language and rediscovering the Ukrainian language. And uh, some musicians would even have like their releases planned on the early March and they would translate the whole album into Ukrainian just because you can't sing in Russian anymore. That you can't stand this language. It's like so painful to hear around. So yes, you would tend to work with this trauma and, and singing in Ukrainian. So probably there are not, not many songs in English yet, but still there are many and you will find them in this uh, Spotify playlist. But Ukrainian language is also like a healing back to roots, back to, back to yourself. Is this the last slide on, on this presentation? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's actually a great point because Agnesa, you told me that you uh, reached out to Latvian TV and radio stations and meeting to drop their support for Russian musicians who are currently supporting the work while also pleading to raise support for Ukrainian artists and uh, even, even the Russian artists who oppose the work uh, openly. So, um, how did that come about? I mean, what was your experience with that? Um, well, I did what I had to do and the response was actually very good and I was very surprised that the radio stations who never played uh, any songs in uh, Latvian they started to play songs in Ukrainian and finally in Latvian as well and that's actually one, I think, huge problem in Europe we do not appreciate these all beautiful languages we have and uh, uh, and Ukrainians now they are a very great example that language doesn't matter. It's all about the message, emotions, feelings, and uh, you start to listen to the song and you realize that you don't not, you don't understand the language, but you get the message. Yeah. And uh, I forgot to add one thing during Soviet Union times, most wanted contrabanda was music records. Uh, from uh, Western Europe or from America, and that's actually a very interesting thing. I don't know if my colleagues from Western Europe knew that. And for example, in Western Ukraine, they were trying to catch the Polish radio station to yeah. listen to that Western yeah. music as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, Marcel, uh, we, uh, what, what is also a very interesting parallel is uh, during 1993, there was this Eurovision song that uh, we, all, we always think about Eurovision being this big pop spect spectacle, but it was also very, very uh, important uh, for the artist, I hope I pronounced him right, Mohamed Fazdanki. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so uh, the artist who went uh, to Ireland uh, and then decided after his performance, after his political statement to go back to Sarajevo. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, great, right. that's, that's, that's it, exactly. So, um, and it was also during this guerrilla mentality that we talked about, things being DIY in Sarajevo, and how it was by default curative. Um, yeah, basically, um, for us it was more to, uh, important to prove that we are attacked, because there was a lot of misinformation back then, uh, there was no internet, there was no like uh, legit um, media coverage of it because we had buffer zone around us. So uh, going to the Eurosong contest was like really a uh, strong importance for us. In that moment, of course, Sarajevo was besieged back then, but there was a small tunnel in the air strip 
this is how uh, this is the illustration for the Winter Olympics 54, and then they uh, put the red uh, zone how we were surrounded, and there was all in this blue small spot here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was the tunnel below the air field, so that was the only way out. It was like uh, you know, one, two kilometers long, and it was like. Uh, you enter on one side, <coughs> you need to leave the dark, and then we, the whole crew of these guys like went uh, to that with the costumes, with everything, so that, that was the uh, idea. And when they went here, uh, the, the idea of the song was like, I don't mean my country, whatever happens in the world. So basically, uh, the whole this kind of uh, small fragments. Uh, the music statements were like the, 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 the strongest for the people, the one that empowered them. You, know, like, you felt like someone went there and gave the message for it. Uh, and it was like really um, somehow the crucial moment, uh, let's say. Uh, we globally somehow defined it. But then again, I think that the, the similar uh, state. In European context, so there was a lot of this kind of uh, fleeing. Uh, people went for some kind of competitions and stuff like that. So there's always two sides of the stories in the world. It's never just one kind of story. So it's hard to, to conclude because everything is looking okay. So somehow you, you can be patriarchy in the beginning, but then you can flee and then you can come later. So it's always true. So, uh, but it is a very interesting parallel one that we have with uh, Stefania, to my people, also Germans, hello. <laughs> so, we have uh, this example with Ms. Stefania and Eurovision, and this whole theme of, yeah, we don't know uh, if there should be like this big political statement. And then, after they would, we get again, as, as you perfectly summarized, this audiovisual thing that really blows you away. The music video for Stefania is a uh, depiction of the bond buildings, uh, and it, it is like a real-time documentation of our song. I would uh, add in this Eurovision song contest, so basically on Eurovision you can't do political messages. Even though the song contest is all about the content, contest between the countries, they still claim that there's no politics there. And at that time, at the end of May, we were screaming out loud to the world that we have to save the Mariupol defenders. It was so such a big round for us. 2,000 people defending their, their home and they're dying without medicine, without food, without the civilians nearby. And for like for Ukrainians, that was the sign. Oh my God, they make it. They really asked for support for Mariupol defenders. It was so important. And from this sign, it was for me especially. It was a sign that music never is is never apolitical. It is always political. Even I, I know what I know what you were talking about at that time when you were talking about not politics in the in the lyrics, but overall music is always as a music and business and music business is always about politics, and um, it's not about you know the heavy responsibility you putting on you, but rather the added value that you have. It's like with our singers who rediscover the influencer stuff with added values with a common cause. It's the same here. Music can have this additional value of a cause that if you really accept this as, a, as being a reality, as being true, it will create an impact then. So your music will not just for making money, not just for entertainment, but for entertainment and something else. And that is our appeal now, that in music business, people should understand that doing their job is always about the politics and it shouldn't be about countries it can be about global climate change but it, it is valuable for every each of us and that's how the artists and the music managers can can, can manage their businesses like operating selecting people with, with whom you want to work and like um, putting 
uh, up these problems. And also like collaboration, like overall music and presence, it's something, it's, it's a soft power. It's a really powerful tool that because we are heard in Europe, people tend to, okay, I don't know anything about Ukraine, but I kind of like that guy performing. This creates empathy. This creates a certain, so that when this person has like seen the news, oh my God, I know that guy, probably his family suffers over there. So this creates this bond and desire maybe to do something. And that's how music becomes political anyway. But at the same time, the country aggressor has been using this tool for ages, for decades, for ages. And that's why there are a lot of people who still feel empathy towards, like, this is just the Putin's war, the Russians are not guilty, but that's why, because they have such a massive cultural presence everywhere in Europe. Even there, the head of the Hermitage Museum, he really confessed that we did a cultural operation all over the world preparing people to support Russia and not Ukraine. So we appeal to you, like, music as the Ukrainian community, we appeal to you, give that place for Ukraine, just just till they will be out from our land. Like the Wagner, Wagner as a composer was also banned in many states in Europe. And we're still now experiencing in many opera houses uh, the flying Dutch. But at that moment it is so important to be culture to support cultural presence of Ukrainian people, of Ukrainian musicians, of Ukrainian culture. And Agnes, you also have lots and lots of ideas. You you also created your own playlist, for example. And we were also talking about how um, right now, unfortunately, uh, people's interest shifts towards uh, the autumn, the winter, the gas prices, and uh, the human suffering becomes almost like a background noise. Uh, and it is it is hard to keep the focus on on what is still happening. So how, um, especially as the Baltic states are obviously also being threatened, um, how what can we as a global community uh, do to help support Ukraine right now? I think it's very important not to get tired of uh, helping Ukraine and talking about uh, uh, this uh, war. And there is even one small thing every musician during the concert can do, like just mention uh, and uh, say his or her opinion about the war and uh, that that's not okay, how Russia is acting uh, and what they are doing in Ukraine. Uh, we have a very great example in, in Latvia, in, in the focus, the biggest uh, Latvian pop band, and they had huge success in Russia uh, before the war, and now they um, are actually, I think they will uh, not uh, be playing anymore because they lost a huge market, but in the closing uh, concerts, uh, they sang a song in uh, Ukrainian, it was their song, they translated that in uh, Ukrainian, and then they said what they think about the war, and that's, it took them like five minutes, but they found the time during their concert, during their joy, uh, to share their emotions and their support for Ukraine. And those small things are very important. And it can be a different. It can. It's not only like mentioning on the concert. Yes, you, what you can do, you can listen to Ukrainian music. You can come to our concert. You can donate. But the thing is that Ukraine, and not only. But I will tell on, on the example of Ukraine. We need a systematic support. It's that exactly as I was talking about. And I have an example like uh, the very Waves Festival where we are here. They are cooperating with Music Expert Ukraine and Ukrainian Institute for four years, bringing Ukrainians here perform. They found we found different ways how to you know how to cover the expenses to this year when Ukrainian really side we, we couldn't afford that. The Waves Festival did a crowdfunding campaign, and we, they had a partner referred uh, and they supported 
reading three Ukrainian ads that we'll be performing tomorrow. Uh, and also inviting managers. I was invited here to have an amazing opportunity to share my experience, to get this experience. This, like, don't forget the managers, managers of the one who rules the, the industry. And that's how you can, can build these connections. Because like every experience is valuable and you never know how great this person can contribute to your team. And also, like we have here to the audience an amazing person who pitches Ukrainian music to European radio station. It's European radio plugin is Vienna based and, and basically he like one hundred percent of, of music he selected was really uh, airing on the radio station in, in, in the whole Europe. And this is just a, like steps and, and you can be creative about this. And you will definitely not be tired of helping because it's, it's a win-win situation. This is the game. Yeah. So Marcel, uh, when, when we, uh, we circle back a little bit one more time, so we have uh, everything that is going on in Ukraine right now as we already Try to summarize this a very audiovisual, very tied to social media, to the internet. That was not the case uh, during the Yugoslav Wars. How? Um, what are your? What What are your maybe even like personal and also regard in regards to the history of your country? What are your takeaways um, from from this from from this thing when we were talking about? Um, you, you, the <laughs> sorry, uh, the Sarian were trying to um, explain that they were victims. Obviously, Ukraine is doing a much more efficient job due to the internet. So, um, uh, I did uh, find the um, level of suffering and victims very hard in the world. We had like seven, ten active wars in the last two decades. So, someone said, like, once, like, why me uh, to the definition that third war. War began because there are more conflicts current happening in the world than it was like in the Second World War. So, so basically, um, the focus of the war was changing constantly. Uh, in one moment, it's Bosnia, in another moment, it's Afghanistan, in the third moment, it's Kosovo, then it's Ukraine, then it's Palestine. So, it's very hard to keep that kind of focus on your country. Uh, it's weird to say that Ukraine had the like, luck to have war in times of internet, so it's it's easier to, to prove to send the message out there. Uh, for us, it was more analog, more lobbying, more sending weapons, more sending people. Everything was much slower. Plus, we had uh, back then extra um, fighting uh, with um, cross information, misreading, uh, the censorship. Uh, Different kind of lobbies that were like stopping us because we were not so interesting uh, position in Ukraine regarding the EU or Russia. It's like much stronger than we were a former socialist country, most the majority of Islamic people. So basically, it was not something that was so interesting to help them. It, it, it's in a civilized world, it's, it's in the Palestine. So, so, so basically, uh, our experience was more like. Um, to stand around the world, and but if you're comparing it, it was much more darker and funnier at the same time. Because the darker you go, then you need like this kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it was like an absurdity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, for example, there were guys that were like uh, listening to radio, see radio wall on both sides of the line. So the guys from our side, Christmas side. They were listening the same radio show, and recently, uh, my, my friend told me, like when I was coming here, that uh, the guy from the other side, he's not now in charge of him in the radio station, and he asked him what he did in war, and he said, like I did like the radio sit show, and he said, yeah, man, you were listening to them, you know, and this is so basically the music was overcoming that, but also the guy, uh, if they knew, for example, for Iron Maiden concert. Uh, the guys were skipping the... Maybe you can explain shortly the Iron Maiden concert. Yeah, at the... In, during the war, a couple of guys arrived, some from UK, the, the, the rain guys, uh, Desert Storm sound system that you see here. 
with the truck through the war borders and everything, like, and they went uh, totally like. So it's almost like an international connection being made. Yeah. Uh, international yeah. musicians traveling uh, directly yeah. to the site and supporting directly. Yeah. It, was, it was like fusion. We had also dark tourism. We were on the other side, the guys that were paying to shoot people with sniper in the city. So there were like different types of the style. That's why I'm saying that it was much more darker. And then we made the fun like this. But uh, I really arrived in one moment. Uh, and the gas for the um, energy was like uh, from the hospital. It's very, very yeah. rock and roll driven. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's in internationally, but I think that's a good, uh, that's a good uh, take yeah, away the international the, connection. Yeah, this is oh, the image from the concert. Yeah. And the, the funny thing was like the guys that went to, to war, uh, be on the line that day or tomorrow, they skipped to the, went to the concert. And they accept to be in prison two days just to have the fun for a little bit. You know, like, so, so basically, in that moment, the line will not fall because of one guy. But in general, in one moment, people are just, if uh, every day 300 shells go to the to, uh, city, then in one moment, people start stop going to the basement. Yeah. You know, like 50% of people will remain in the building, so whatever. So, so, so it, it was like, it's, it's when you're pushing the limits yeah. of the human and you are discovering totally like uh, different fields of, of like, let's focus on the board for us. Yes, uh, and what I find interesting is uh, it, exactly this, uh, even without the internet, uh, the international musicians coming together and the international music community uniting was also very crucial obviously and helped a lot even without the advantages of the internet that we have now. This is when we also talk about cultural diplomacy. Oops. Uh, or cultural diplomacy. So you uh, mentioned this being very, very important. What exactly does cultural diplomacy mean for you? And how, how, how is it tied to the systemic support you were talking about? What does it entail? What are the examples? So I just want to summarize, like, because this experience is with, it's almost like very similar because, yes, have an internet in Kiev, but don't have an internet in occupied Kherson doesn't mean that the dark times is never happening there. Or nobody has seen what exactly Russian did in Bucha, but we saw the photos out, like, you know, out there when the journalists came. But talking about cultural diplomacy, I already mentioned that the presence is the, the goal and it makes people empath em feel empathy, it makes people uh, want to act and this makes people... And when, when I'm talking about this the cultural presence, it's also um, about not only like, you know, like you're just helping them, I want to make sure that helping them as you have you here as well because European community is all about inclusion and Ines mentioned that we have this inappreciation of the some languages that are there and we have a, a long road to do to have that safe and multicultural environment that are represented equally and has their audiences and this is the, 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 the original goal. But for now, cultural diplomacy is a, a, a one more front for us. And it reached us like I am the cultural manager, the whole, the whole thing what I was doing. So when you're waking up in the metro station, you go back home, you have some food, you find the medicine around like several only pharmacies, you go buy bread or you don't buy bread, you know, but you buy something else probably, and then eventually like, you're helping the elderly people, but then you come back to the curfew zone, to, uh, to the, the wall shelter, and the only thing you do, you do the cultural diplomacy. You're telling your friends, your neighbor, uh, colleagues, everybody, what is going on, and the efficient way was to do that through the art, through the music. So, just to make this present. And uh, yes, uh, that's also a. Uh, uh, you you also mentioned this whole 
talk well, while you were talking about the, the, Euro, the European Union is also like there should, there should be diversity that is also celebrated. You told me uh, how uh, you don't like the separation between East and West. Why? Because, I don't know, again, I don't want to offend anybody, but uh, usually when you mention that you are from Eastern Europe, you are treated like you are less something special. And uh, you're like, oh, you're my poor sister, you know, it's so interesting. But uh, we are who we are. We have these experiences, we have our history, we have our identity, and we we need to appreciate more our neighbors, who we are. We do not need to look the same or sound the same. That's that's like th those are things we do not appreciate. I want to add on this about like there are some certain you know like stickers on the countries like post Soviet country, post Soviet country, post communist, and all that stuff. The thing is that. Like Europe has uh, experience with colonial um, colonial trades. This is the, again nobody tells about the colonial trades of Russia, and they did colonization differently than Europeans did. But this colonial trades, we had to we understand that all like there are fifteen nations inside Russia, totally. Uh, totally naked without their identity. They wanted to do that to Ukraine, to Belarus, to Baltic countries, to uh, Moldavia, to Caucasus countries. So we should work with this the way you the way Western world worked with the colonial past. Um, it's so great to uh, also have had the opportunity to talk about the historical backgrounds and how many events there are that echo each other and um, the, the learnings and takeaways that we can all uh, take from each other. Uh, I think um, where I found also very interesting, the building resilience takeaway, uh, the cultural diplomacy, the uh, fighting for uh, even one step after another and um, what I also the, the last point I, I wanted to mention is uh, I, I don't remember I don't remember who of you said that um, it mustn't always be English or French you know when they talk about uh, this music or songs in the European is that also kind of a political statement if, if we talk about languages so obviously yes but like <laughs> unless you're talking about Russian language because basically. The political statement was to you know, protect the Russian speaking people in Ukraine, protect them in Baltic countries, protect them all over the world. So, um, so you should define this, you know, like the, the language of aggression. Uh, but at the same time, of course, the war will be over. We will win, and then we will we'll have to build those relationships with the neighbor. We never begun, and this is. This is the way, like inside of a European community, if you let if you let somebody in, basically this is a great opportunity to enrich your community with the language, with the culture, with the traditions, and display them equally. And usually on the festivals, um, I'm not talking about base now, but necessarily, but usually on the festivals they have they invite people from the neighboring country. The region, and it makes sense, of course. But if you are a festival, you, can, you should be diverse, and this is how you and, and you will be displaying the the wider regions in them. That's how you bring it together. And it's so great seeing all uh, three of you sharing all this knowledge: uh, Baltic, Balkan, Ukraine, uh, standing together, and, and also giving the sign of unity that is very very important right now. Uh, as to say that we are in peace and united. Uh, we all know what is at stake. Even during we speak, the war is still going on. And I think this is this this must be a reminder of every single day to all of our friends or our, our environments, so that people do not forget in the following months or even years. We don't even know how long this war is going to last. And I think I, I'll. Uh, 
Oh, I'll have to tie it up, unfortunately. Um, I'm so sorry that we don't have more time to discuss this, uh, but I really, really thank you for all your insight. Thank you for being here. And uh, especially thank you for everything that each and every one of you is contributing. Um, so further information about the eight programs, charities, playlists, and even historical events mentioned is compiled on the unofficial site we put up, provided by the participants. So there are some links you can check out. Um, thank you again for this talk. And wait. Yeah, this is the QR code. Uh, so if you click on the triangles, you can find uh, a compilation of videos aid programs, charities, the way you can donate, the way you can support. There's also the playlist of Mariana, the playlist of Agnes, and yeah, great. Now I'll just show it. And everything that you've heard during this panel talk, please feel free to check out click on the triangles. It will show the embedded homepage. Please, please, please do check it out. It is really a matter of urgency. So thank you very much. So, yeah, this is all the courage, strength, and perseverance for the future.